Hi, I'm John Walton, and I'm here to talk to you today about something that I believe is very important for the life of the church. You know, we believe that the Bible is the foundation of how we think about the world, how we think about ourselves, and how we come to know God better. And so it's important for us to understand the Bible as well as we can. There are difficult passages in the Bible, and especially we find that a passage like Genesis 1 and 2 provides us with uh, much controversy and great difficulties. And those passages require us to think deeply and to analyze carefully so we make sure that we know what it is that the Bible is claiming. That's what I want to talk about today. I'm not a scientist, uh, but I've spent my life studying the Bible, and I'd like to share with you some of the things that I've learned. And maybe it'll give you some things that'll help you to think in fresh ways about the text. It is important for the church because it's important for how we think about God and how we know God and his relationship to the world. It matters because it has to do with how we think about ourselves and the people that surround us. And so we're going to spend some time trying to understand this portion of God's Word as best we can. Are science and Christianity in conflict? Uh, definitely. I think it's a huge controversy right now, uh, science and religion. Um, I was personally raised like Catholic, so I know that there's a lot of controversy and stuff like that. I think we've always had them and we always will be uh, in conflict with science and creationism. The whole idea of creating a life on its own without having, you know, parents or like just doing it with stem cell and stuff like that. I think to that extent, yeah, there's conflict over there. Yeah, I think they are. Although they do have like some spots that are similar, I think they're like mainly in conflict. It's gonna be hard because I've noticed how people, when they do believe in the Bible and some people are trying to um, like explain that God doesn't exist, so I would say it'd be hard for them. Uh, yes, I do, because people that are Christian don't believe in evolution. They don't believe in, oh, well, how did we get here? The whole we came from monkeys thing, and apparently it's against the law to teach evolution in any class. I wouldn't say that they're in conflict, but a lot of it intertwines with one another. Like, if you read a lot into the Bible, um, I want to say like Genesis, it has a lot to do with um, science nowadays, uh, evolution, and a whole bunch of criteria just like that. I think people make them in conflict when they don't need to be in conflict. Yeah, they are. Like, you know, how they have it in schools where, you know, you're not supposed to be teaching religion, really. It's not a major conflict. It's like some things they disagree on, some things they agree on. Pretty much the huge argument is between where we came from and where we'll go. And I think it's going to be yeah, impossible to actually solve those two, so there will always be conflict in our world. When we get started then, we have to talk about how we're going to approach the Bible. After all, if we want to understand it properly, we have to approach it properly. And so we want to talk about how we think about the Bible as we read it, how we come to understand what it has to say. Lots of times when Christians talk about reading the Bible, they talk about reading it literally. And that's an important concept. I think that when I try to express that for myself, you know, I use all kinds of books and tools because I'm serious about the Bible and I want to read it seriously. For me, that means I want to read it for what it intended to say. Whatever it is that the author wanted to say, I'm going to take seriously. And I'm not going to try to edge around it or you know, tap dance through it, uh, I want to understand what the author was trying to communicate. So that's what we're going to focus, focus on first. Hello, it's great to be here today to talk about something that's very important to me, and since you're all here, I assume something that's very important to you. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Genesis chapters 1 through 3, and to talk about how we can interpret the text so that it's, we're sure that we're getting what we need to get from that text. Uh, it's an important text for lots of the things that uh, are in conversation uh, throughout the country and the world today as we think about science and the Bible. And that's where we want to start. 
as we talk about science in the Bible and how we should think about those things. Anytime I talk about uh, these issues, we have to start uh, at the foundations, and that means we have to talk about authority. Uh, I believe very strongly in the authority of the biblical text, and uh, in many of the audiences uh, that I talk to, that's what's really important. And so authority is what we have to establish and how we go about finding out that which has authority in the biblical text. Uh, the first point to make is one that uh, we understand that God has a purpose that he has to carry out in Scripture. How does he do that? Well, God chose to do it through human authors. Now, it could have been done other ways, but that's what God chose to do. And that means that God's purpose is being carried out through the human author's purpose. That's how the procedure worked. So that means that the authority of what God is communicating is vested in that human author. So that's what we want to try to understand. For that reason, we have to, we have to understand that the text is not written to us. That human author lived in a particular time period, in a particular cultural context, spoke a particular language. And the communication that he gave was a communication that was directed toward his audience, in his language, in his culture. So it was communicated to them, not to us. Now, having said that, of course, we also understand that the Bible is for us. The reason God did all of this was for his word to be communicated broadly to all people of all time. And so it's for us, but it's not to us. The message then transcends culture, but the form of it is culture bound. And that means that we have some work to do. What we need to do is try to take our place in the audience of that communicator so that we can hear it the way that first audience heard it. Now that's got some very difficult issues for us to tackle because we don't know the language and we don't know the culture. But we have to try to read the text in that way. Now as this author was communicating, and again lots of times this is communicated orally uh, before it was written down, but as that communication took place, uh, we need to understand that there is integrity in the communication between the author and his first audience. What I mean by that is that the author knew what he was talking about, the speaker knew what he was talking about, and assumed that he was communicating effectively to the audience, and that therefore they could understand what he was talking about. It wasn't information that was way beyond them, that uh, just sounded like gibberish or sounded mystical or something of that sort. It was meaningful, so there's some integrity to the communication. Now that communication was taking place in what we call a high context. High context is where the speaker and the audience share a great deal of information. They, they understand things and therefore there are things that don't need to be explained because there's a lot that, that is common ground for them. Um, so a high context would be if you were in an upper level course and the professor didn't have to cover the basics anymore. He knows you know that stuff. And so communicating in, at the level at which you are. And if a beginner were to sit into that class, they, there's a lot of things they might not catch. That's high context. The speaker and the audience have much in common and communication can assume a lot of background knowledge. Okay, the difference with that is low context. Low context is where the speaker and the audience have little common ground, and so a lot has to be explained. So if I teach material to a sixth grade class, there's a lot more I have to explain. I can't assume they know it. Okay, so what we have is that the speaker and his audience in the biblical context, they share a high context, and there are things they will not be explaining. We come in as a low context audience and therefore there are things that we're not so clear about and that we have to try to, to come up to, to understand. We've got, again, some work to do. So when we start thinking about the entering this world of the uh, communicator and his audience, uh, one of the first things we have to talk about is seeing the world the way the text saw the world. After all, they didn't have the perspective on the world around them that we have. 
Uh, we tend to think of uh, a variety of things when we think about something like the moon or the sun. Uh, there are things that come to mind that's part of how we think about those things, about the, the world we live in, the globe we live on. And of course, they don't have those ideas. And so if we're going to enter that world of communication, uh, we have to understand some of these things about the way they thought about the world. Um, they're not addressing the world as everybody everywhere would understand it. They're talking about the world as they understand it. And God's communicating through that understanding. He's not giving them a, a new view of looking at it. So when we think about how they thought about the world, we have um, information from Egypt in texts, in reliefs, in tomb paintings, that, where they display how they think about the world. And it's a world that's heavily peopled with deities. So the sky is the sky god arched over the earth. The earth god is prone on the ground, and the air god is holding them apart. The sun god is sailing across the upper waters. And so it's, it's heavily populated with deities. And in that way, they express what's most important to them about the world as they understand it. It's not so much the material shape of the world, it's rather the gods who are in charge of the world. And that's what they picture. So when they portray the cosmos as they understand it, that's what they're thinking about. Now, of course, for the Israelites, they don't have gods populating every aspect of the cosmos. They have one god who rules it all, who's in charge of it all. And so they don't think of a picture of the cosmos that's quite like that. But likewise, they're not thinking of a picture of the cosmos the way we do. They still have the idea of a solid sky, the pillars of the earth that hold it up, and who knows what those pillars rest on, waters below, waters above. Everybody in the ancient world believed there were waters above and waters below. Um, if we're going to get the authority of the text, we have to see the world the way they're thinking about it. We can't impose our view of the world on the text because then we're changing it. We're making something that wasn't. If the authority is in the human communicator to his initial audience, that's the meaning we have to work with. So Israel likewise had a different view of the cosmos than what we have. So whose cosmic geography counts? Whose view of the cosmos is most important? Well, again, if we want the authority of the text, we cannot provide our cosmic geography. Likewise, we cannot expect that God is going to embed in that message some private future cosmic geography to be seen when later audiences like us get there. He rather is going to communicate through the cosmic geography that they understand. So authority is tied into seeing the text for what it is in its communication. Okay, so as we think about authority, we also must understand that we have to see the text the way the Israelites saw the text. Again, that's where God's role is taking place in that communication from the human author to the human audience. So how did they view the text? When we look at any passage of scripture, we have to ask the question, how would the Israelite author and audience understand this text with what they knew? Now, it may be that God is using that communication to give them new information. He often does about himself, about his role in the world, about people and who they are. Certainly, God is involved in giving them new information. But we have to try to understand what new information he does give and what new information he doesn't give. Okay, so we have to think of the text in their eyes and what they would understand. That's where authority takes place. Our goal is to be ethical readers. What does it mean to be an ethical reader? What we want to do as an ethical reader is to understand the text the way the author wanted to be understood without trying to read anything into it and without trying to squeeze anything out of it. We want to read it as the author intended. 
we all know that if someone uh, today is making a speech and a newspaper reporter pulls out just one quote, a, a sound bite from that speech, and publishes it and then makes it seem like something else was being said, that's not ethical. And we can't do that with the Bible either. We have to read it in its context. So as ethical readers, we want to understand the text the way the author wanted to be understood. Okay, that means that we have to understand carefully the genre of the literature. Genre is the mode that's being used for communication. And so we better understand how that genre works and how it communicates. We have to understand the cultural perspective because all communication takes place within a culture. And so we have to understand that aspect of the text. We need to also understand the focus of Revelation. That is, uh, the, there are incidentals in the communication of the text that are not the issue that's being revealed. Again, we're going to talk a little bit later about the idea that the biblical author is not revealing a new cosmic geography. He's talking about cosmic geography as they know it. And as a result, we don't see cosmic geography as the revelation that the text is giving. As ethical readers, we want to dis discern what is the focus of the revelation. All of this means that we can't make the text be what we want it to be. We can't demand that the text speak to us on our terms. We have to accept its terms. The author has chosen the conventions tied to the culture, tied to the genre, tied to the truth that that author wants to communicate. And so we can't take that and say, well, but wait a minute, we want to understand something else about origins. We want to know what the photograph would look like. We want to run the videotape of what the creation would have looked like. We have to be content with what the author has done. The author of Genesis 2 is not interested in giving the equivalent of a photo. And to that extent, we would have to say, you can't get there from here. We can't expect to reconstruct a scientifically sophisticated view of origins from a biblical text that is not trying to do that. It is their conventions that count. And that's where we're going to find the authority of the text, by tracking with their conventions. Hey there, this is Phil Vischer, the creator of Veggie Tales and What's in the Bible. I am here with my good friend John Walton. I'm a big fan of science, and I've loved reading some of John's stuff, and so I invited him to sit down and have a conversation. So, John, thanks for coming. It's great to be here. So, I've read your book, The Lost World of Genesis 1, uh, and uh, you've been talking about it in this DVD and in your classes, and uh, we wanted to get in a little bit deeper, like the concept of context. You talk about high and low context. That's a little fuzzy to me. Can you dig into that a little bit more? Sure. Uh, that's where I'm trying to understand sort of how communication takes place. Because if we're going to try to, to benefit from the communication of Scripture, then we have to know how, how that works. Um, we could okay. use an example of, of high context uh, in our own culture. Uh, there are all kinds of uh, topics and issues uh, that we talk about where we have kind of a specialized language that we all know what it means. Uh, for take example. for example, sure, um, daylight savings time. Yes. Okay, daylight savings time. What is going on? Well, we just use that phrase and we figure everybody knows what we're talking about. You know, if somebody came from another culture who, where they didn't use daylight savings time and we're trying to learn English and things like that, they'd say, okay, I know the word daylight and I know the word savings and I know the word time, but what in the world are you talking about? Right. And right. then if we tried to explain it, we'd find ourselves in trouble. Well, it's, it's when we change time. You what? Oh, yeah, well, well it's, we all agree to it. Can you do that? You know, th right. there's all kinds of right. questions we would have about exactly how, what does this mean? And it's a, it's a cultural concept that's, okay. that's behind that phrase. So would slang be another example, where we're writing or speaking with slang and someone sure. else has no idea what that means? Slang would be an example, even in texting. We, we use a high oh. context uh, situation where we assume that all of our shortcuts and abbreviations, people are going to understand. So we say the Bible has authority. 
Um, but then you're telling me that maybe some of the things that it was saying to the Israelites that they understood about their world or the way they saw the world or the way they believed the world was set up were actually incorrect. Here's where we get the difference between the kind of hooks you hang communication on and the communication itself. There are things we use to frame our communication, and there are the things that we really want to say. And in that situation, we have a case where uh, God is going to communicate to the Israelites using a framework uh, of, of things that are familiar to them, because communication has to happen okay. in terms of the familiar. So he's going to use what's familiar to them to talk about the things that are important to him. Gotcha. And so what we want to really learn is not what it was, was literal to the Israelites, but what was true to God. Uh, it's not necessarily a sense of literal. Okay. It's a matter of just the... You don't like the word literal, do you? Well, you know, different people understand it different ways. <laughs> and so you always have to be, be careful with terms that can take on a variety of meanings. You know, these chameleon right. terms uh, that can sneak in. Right. So, uh, so in that sense, you know, we want to take the text seriously. Uh, but what we want to take seriously is what it is that the text is seeking to communicate with its authority. Right, fantastic. Okay, uh, cosmic geography. You're talking about cosmic geography and what cosmic geography the, the Israelites had and, and what God showed them, and I don't even know what that means. What is cosmic geography? Cosmic geography is the, how we understand the shape of the world around us. Uh, so our cosmic geography includes a globe, it includes a number of identified continents mm -hmm. and the oceans, it includes our understanding of the way the world is, the way the earth is situated in the solar system uh, with reference to the planets and the sun and the moon, uh, the stars okay. being far away, all of that is our cosmic so geography. So Mars is part of our cosmic mm -hmm. geography. It is indeed. The mm -hmm. galaxies that we're aware of, everything we know and how it's right. set up and how it works. And all of that is, is pretty instinctive to us because we We've learned it. Right. We've learned it through the culture. We've learned it through our early education experiences. And so we have this cosmic geography, which is representative of, of where our culture stands in understanding the world around us. Okay. And what does that have to do with Israel? Well, they don't have the same cosmic geography as we do. How do we know? Uh, we know that because we have texts in the Bible itself which talks about their cosmic geography. We have texts from the ancient world in which Israel was, was of which Israel was a part, and we have that cosmic geography. And so we have a, quite a bit of literature, uh, okay. both in the Bible and out, that tells us so about their cosmic geography. So when God inspires someone to write something in the Bible, who, whose cosmic geography does God have in mind? Well, see, that's exactly the question. Lots of times modern readers will look at it and say, oh, well, since the Bible is true, it must speak to the cosmic geography that I believe is true. Right. And so we'll try to find uh, maybe echoes or indicators, read between the lines, try to find mm -hmm. kind of what we believe to be a true cosmic geography. Uh, but of course, the fact is, uh, all issues of science, cosmic geography included, are, are in flux right, and things right. change. And so even our sense of what the cosmic geography is may not be correct. Well, there, there, there are may ways. not be a Mars. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> okay, so what about genres of scripture? When we look at, is it poetry? Is it history? Is it, you know, is it revelation, apocalyptic stuff? When we look at Genesis 1 um, and Genesis 2, you know, we're, we're often asking, okay, is this history? Well, the minute we start using labels like that, uh, it's not just an innocent label that's just sitting there waiting to be defined. It's a label that we already have definitions for, and lots of times those definitions are already tied into our cultural ways of viewing things. Mm. Um, you know, we, use a, we use a term like uh, history. Of course, history refers to events. Uh, literature that's writing history uh, could be called historiography if you want to get fancy and technical mm -hmm. with it. Um, I like fancy yeah, words. Yeah, you like that? Yeah. So the, the idea of um, uh, a certain genre where you record events, well, now you have to ask the question, is really recording events the major focus? Is that what's going on, or is something right. else happening? Uh, to call something um, history would have one set of assumptions, some of them modern, um, perhaps some of them not, but they would also have, uh, you would also talk about cosmology. Uh, what's, what's that carry along mm -hmm. with it? Uh, how would that be different? 
can cosmology be history? Can history be cosmology? We have a lot of Is there a better terms. term for Genesis 1? Well, if, if we talk about what the text is intending to do and what its focus is, we would have to include cosmology as part of it because it wants to understand the cosmos. Right. And so they're going to use that kind of uh, approach and understanding. That doesn't mean it's any less historical. It just it's a difference of how you word what's going on. Basically, Genesis, uh, the, the author of Genesis has tried to communicate some of the deepest truths that, that he knows and that he wants to reveal as mm -hmm. God has given it to him. And so what's the best vehicle for that truth? Uh, the choice of a best vehicle is going to be dependent on what conventions best suit. Let me give you an example. Okay. Um, if we looked at a, a painting, Picasso's painting of right. uh, one of his models, Dora Maar. Okay, uh, yes, and, crazy stuff. Yeah, we, we'd look at that painting and we'd say, wow, I mean, that's just all over the place. Uh, wh what's, She's got seven what, eyeballs yeah, and what? four sides of her head visible yeah, at once. Exactly, what, what was he thinking? Um, now, we could also look at a photograph of Dora Maar and we'd say, okay, that makes more sense to me. But mm -hmm. see, that has to do with conventions mm -hmm. that, that we're using and that we prefer. Uh, sometimes we come to a Genesis text and we want something more like a photograph, whereas the author might be given us something more like a Picasso. Uh, mm -hmm. You could look at the Picasso and you could look at the photograph and say, I can't get there from here. I can't, I could never take that painting and reproduce the photograph. Right. right. And sometimes that's how it is in literature as well. Wow. You can't so. necessarily reproduce what you think would be most useful to you. Genesis 1 is abstract art. I wouldn't call it a Picasso. <laughs>
Uh, and th that was important for me to start to s scout out the territory. And so as I approached my graduate study, that was my default position, a young earth position uh, that was trying to find flaws and faults in the evolutionary theory, which in those days was presented in, in, as an alternative to belief in God and creation. If someone believes in the Bible, can they accept the results of modern science? Um, I think they could. Um, evolution is part of everyday life, so whether whatever they believe, evolution is everywhere. Um, I don't really, I don't know a lot about the Bible. With science, it's you were never there to see how the world was created. Right. So it's it's literally both directions are both based on faith. That's a tough question. I think that's like. <laughs> And that's why we, we have all these arguments all the time. I think that there's equally as much truth in Christianity as there is in evolution. It all depends on what you believe, how you were raised. So, People who believe in God or, or religion, like the, obviously God puts that idea into someone's mind. Because some things in the science world can explain some things that's in the Bible world. Can someone believe in the Bible and also accept evolution? Yeah, I'm a Christian and I believe in evolution. So I think it's possible for everybody if they just try. If you take the Bible from a not literal standpoint and from a figurative standpoint, a lot of stuff like evolution and stuff actually fits really easily into Christianity. I just don't think that there should be a label on certain beliefs that you have to believe one thing, you have to believe another thing. I believe that just believe whatever you want to believe. Um, usually people that believe in the Bible also don't think that evolution exists at all. I don't know why. Never read the Bible. Well, obviously evolution happened. How did we get here? Is it possible? Actually, no. It's probably, it's probably not possible to develop. I could, I still accept the Bible and I still believe in evolution, but everyone's different. Everyone has a different opinion. I feel like they can accept the, uh, evolution if you do believe in the Bible. I mean, nowadays we live in an open world. Why not? someone who's really religious could totally be completely against evolution because they believe that the Bible is what you go by and there's like nothing else. I believe if you believe in everything the Bible says then you can't really believe in evolution but I believe you can believe in religion and Christianity but maybe not the Bible itself. Evolution would be a way of explaining how God did creation or the method in which it happened because there isn't really specifications on that in the Bible. So here we are in a modern scientific laboratory. Is this where people are able to find out about God and what things God does and what things he doesn't do? Is science encroaching on who God is and what God is involved in? I don't think so. As we talk about things today, we want to find out how we think about this whole idea of God's work in the world and what we can discover by science and how the two relate. It's important for our understanding of the Bible so that we know what the Bible is doing and what science is doing. Once we've talked about the issue of biblical authority, we have to start thinking about how that relates to how we think about science and about the world around us. And as we try to integrate those things, sometimes people talk about uh, the word and the world. Uh, God's communicated through both, and we want to try to, to make sure we see all of those things together the way that we ought to. We've already talked about the idea that in literature, like we find in the biblical account of, of origins, uh, the artist, the writer, the communicator has made choices, choices about how to communicate to the audience that he is addressing. And in those choices, it's not a matter of something being true or false. The artist's conventions are simply the one that they've chosen. And we have to try to understand those conventions so that we can get the truth that is being conveyed there. Now, there's where we might sometimes find some perceived conflict with the way we think about our world. Because our world is describing things through other conventions. 
as scientists do their work and describe the world and how it works, uh, they're working from a different model than what Scripture is working from. They're trying to understand the truth of the world, but they're just working at it a different way. And so sometimes as we look at the conventions for scientific investigation and communication and compare that to the biblical text, we feel like there may be some conflict that's there that needs to be resolved. And so we have to think about how we can talk about these two aspects of what we believe is the larger body of truth that is meaningful to us today. Now one of the first things that we have to talk about then is this whole question about that which is natural or that which is supernatural. Um, obviously when we have our theology that we bring to the world around us, we believe that God is active, He has been in the past, uh, God is responsible for, for all of, of origins and all of creation, all of the sustaining of the, the world. Uh, that's what God does. Uh, yet at the same time, scientists are trying to understand the same world uh, with a cause and effect understanding. Um, you know, now I'm not a scientist and I don't pretend to be able to talk about science and, and what they do, uh, except in the most general terms. But that's kind of the level of investigation that's involved. Cause and effect that can be explained by natural laws and those kinds of ideas. So, the question of what is natural, that is cause and effect, natural laws, what is supernatural? What's God involved in? And sometimes when we get thinking about that question today, we think in terms of, oh, let's say, a pie. And we've got this pie, which let's call it the origins pie. And that pie we have sliced up into pieces, all the different aspects of origins. And we try to figure out, well, is that part something that God did, or is it something that has a natural explanation? And so we start labeling our pie pieces with the whipped cream, you know, N for, for natural and S for supernatural. And the minute that we find out something has a natural explanation, um, we have to eat that whipped cream with the S and put an N on it, okay, because it's going to be uh, uh, differently understood. Well, the problem with that view is that the more we understand, the more science is able to explain, the smaller and smaller the supernatural part of the pie, until there are hardly any S's left on there. And that feels like God is being diminished and reduced. Okay? Now, the problem with, with that viewpoint is the dessert. We've got the wrong dessert here. Now, what we really need to think about instead of a pie that we're slicing up, to think about a cake, a layer cake, a birthday cake. And in that cake, we can think about the lower level as representing the natural world with natural explanations, laws that, that help us to understand and explain things, uh, and that can be understood and investigated by scientists. The top layer of the cake is what God is doing. That top layer of the cake covers everything on the bottom layer. No matter what science discovers or explains, that doesn't reduce God's role in it. Whatever happens in this world or in the origins of this world is something God is doing. Whether natural explanations exist or not doesn't affect the matter. Actually, in the ancient world, uh, they, they only thought of cause and effect in personal terms. That is, either people or gods. Okay? Those were the only categories of cause and effect. They had no such category as natural cause and effect. And so in the Bible, they're going to attribute it all to either people or God. The fact that they attribute something to God doesn't mean that we're out of bounds to look for a natural explanation. Now, some things I don't expect we would ever find a natural explanation. The resurrection, the incarnation, okay, but other things we may. And if we do, that's all right. If some of the plagues could be explained by natural cause and effect, that's okay. God was doing it anyway. 
Okay, so we have to understand the, the categories and how we work with the categories. Think of the cake. Science can explore that bottom layer all they want, explain as much of the world as we understand the, the natural laws, the cause and effect, the mechanisms, whether it's uh, origins or whether it's operations. They can explain everything as much as they would like to do, but that top layer is still over all of it. Okay, so we just have to get the right dessert. Now, when we start thinking about this in more specific terms, we have to understand that in the Bible, there is no new scientific revelation. God does not seek to change the way that they thought about the mechanisms of the world around them and its operations. He has a lot of new information to tell them about himself, about what he's doing in the world, and those kinds of things. But there's no new scientific revelation about the, the mechanics or operations of the world. Instead, he's content to communicate to them on the basis of what they already understand. Okay, so, for instance, an example. In the ancient world, they believed that uh, the thinking, cognitive, emotive processes all took place down here. Okay, the liver, the kidney, the heart, the intestines, even the stomach. Sometimes I think with my stomach. But at any rate, the idea here is that um, all of those processes took place down here, not up here. They've got a different physiology, a way of thinking about physiology, than what we do. That's why throughout the Bible you'll find uh, the discussions about thinking with your heart. What you think in your heart, how you act from your heart. Because that's the physiology that they believed. God doesn't change it. God doesn't say, don't think in terms of your heart, think in terms of your brain. There is no biblical Hebrew word for brain. Even passages that talk about all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that word for mind, entrails. Your translators are helping you. Okay, so the, all of those processes took place here as far as they were concerned. Again, the point being, God does not give them scientific revelation to upgrade their understanding of something like physiology, nor of meteorology, nor of anatomy, nor of any of the scientific processes that are part of our world. God's not upgrading them. Okay, so we have to understand then that when we read those parts in the Bible, the Bible's not trying to give us an authoritative science. It's communicating about what God is doing in the world using the science that they knew as they knew it. So, uh, as we talk then about God and his cause and effect processes, God's role in that does not replace a natural cause and effect. So, say that another way, the observation of natural cause and effect does not remove God from the picture. Take Psalm 139, 13. The psalmist says, You have knit me together in my mother's womb. And we could all affirm that, that God has knit us together in our mother's womb. That doesn't mean that embryology is godless garbage, okay, that we can't pay any attention to because the Bible tells us how that happens. No, the fact is everything that we learn about embryology is helping us to understand how God knits us together in our mother's wombs. So the fact that the Bible gives a divine statement about cause and effect does not mean that we cannot look for natural cause and effect or could not accept an explanation of natural cause and effect. Okay, the two are operating separately. We've got two different layers of the cake. Now, as we approach these issues, some people would be in a category that we call concordism. In concordism, we have a situation where people are trying to either read science into the Bible or they're trying to read science out of the Bible. This is concordism as an interpretive tool. Those who want to read science out of the Bible will read a statement in Genesis 1 about the waters above and the waters below. And they'll say, well, the Bible's always true, so there must be waters above and waters below. So that becomes part of our science. Now, of course, when they recognize that it's kind of hard to find those waters above, they might either speculate on waters above that used to be there, 
or they might try to give a modern scientific explanation like it's the clouds or it's a, the atmosphere in some way. Or, but of course, then what's happening? You're giving modern meanings to Hebrew words. And suddenly the authority and the integrity of the communication is being forfeited because we're trying to make that text say something that it never meant. And the problem then with reading a science out of the text is that it's working on the assumption that the text is doing science, which it is not. Okay, if you want to read science into the text, you know, we, again, we run into the same difficulty. If we try to say that the that God stretching out the heavens is some kind of cryptic allusion to the expanding universe. Um, we've got a little bit of a difficulty. It didn't mean that to them. The authority is what it meant to them. And therefore, we have to understand that that's not a scientific statement and that the, the text really isn't talking about the Big Bang or the expanding universe or things of that sort, molecules or photons or nebulae. The text is not addressing those things, and we can't expect to read that between the lines of the text because then we are inserting what we are then attributing authority to. Instead, we take something called accommodation. Accommodation is when we are understanding that God has accommodated the human author and audience's understanding as he communicates to them. He is using a framework of communication that reflects things that they believe so that he can make the point he needs to make. After all, it really doesn't matter what you think with. God's interested that you think godly thoughts, that you think pure thoughts, that you think faithful thoughts. He's not interested in what you think with. And so that's not part of the revelation. Again, we're back to the focus of revelation. Now, we've always heard, and it's true, the Bible is not a science textbook. Okay, but we have implications for that that we have to follow. As we've mentioned, not only is it not a science textbook, but there's no new scientific revelation in the Bible. Everything that's there is compatible with old world science. It's things that Israel already thought, things that everybody around them thought. After all, everybody in the ancient world believed there was waters above. Everybody in the ancient world believed you thought with your entrails and your heart and your kidney and your liver. This is not new, new information and it's not information that corrects. Likewise, it's not an authoritative statement that we now have to figure out how our blood pumps do cognitive processes. Okay, that's not the focus of the revelation. So we have to consider carefully what scientific claims the Bible might be making. If it's not a science textbook, and it has no new scientific information, then what scientific claims are there? Now again, we have to tread carefully here, um, we have to see there's a difference, for instance, between a historical claim and a scientific claim. If we're talking about something like the parting of the Red Sea, there's a historical claim, and there's a theological claim. Okay, but what is the scientific claim? And those are the things we have to sort out carefully. Some scientific ideas could be inferred from the biblical text to be entailments but many of those are actually the result of interpretation or are simply cultural understandings for communication and really not the focus of revelation. So we have to understand distinctions when we are considering claims versus entailments. A final example. We have, for instance, raw text. The Bible uses the word day, yom, to talk about the seven days of creation. That's what the text says. Interpretation of that text would say yom is a 24-hour period. That's interpretation. A scientific claim is that the earth is therefore young. And then the supposed possible scientific entailment would be that the Big Bang and the expanding universe are all unacceptable ideas, unbiblical. We have to draw distinctions between the text or interpretation, the claims and the entailments. Okay, Dr. Walton, you say there is no new science in the Bible. How could that be? We've been looking for new science for years and coming up with all sorts of mm -hmm. odd things. Why do you say there's no new science? 
Well, it's a matter of having looked through everything in the Old Testament to see how it matches up to what people believed in the ancient world. Okay. And I just find that there's nothing there that wouldn't have made perfect so, sense to them. So, Isaiah 40, 22, it says the circle of the earth. It tells us the earth is round ahead of time, before anyone else knew. Yes, but indeed that Hebrew word does not refer to a sphere, but to a disk. And everyone in the ancient world believed the earth was a disk and therefore round and had a circle. So it was partly right. It's partial credit. Partial credit. Okay. How did, talk about natural law and, the, and you know, the layer cake thing and supernatural and, 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 you know, God working and then natural and just processes. How, that's how we look at it, you know, with natural processes and all these laws of, of the universe. How did the Israelites look at it? Uh, you know, we talk about that. You know, I use that layer cake model, which might help us to make some sense of our world in the way that we think. But for Israel, they wouldn't have had any such idea. Uh, in the ancient world, every cause was personal. That is, either God or people are involved, and they wouldn't have seen any cause uh, originating in mm. some other way. And so for them, they wouldn't have had to try to explain uh, natural laws and natural cause and effect. Everything mm -hmm. was, was what God was doing. So who's right and who's wrong? Were the Israelites right? Is God doing everything? Or are we right and he only does certain special things on holidays? Uh, they're both helpful ways to think. We believe as Christians that God is involved in everything that happens. And that's why we've got that top layer of the cake in our picture. God's involved with all of it. Yet we still recognize that science uh, in order to be done, needs to think in terms of natural laws and natural cause and effect. And that's a perfectly legitimate way for us to try to understand the world around us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we think God is in charge of everything, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't always believe it. Well, I think we have trouble integrating our worldview as, as well. I mean, we mm -hmm. watch the, the weather report and we hear about the high pressure systems and low pressure systems and all of this and we readily acknowledge that. We haven't gone picketing the weather stations and asking to put God back in the weather report. <laughs> but then we turn, change the channel to the televangelist who tells us which storm is God's judgment on which demographic and group. that becomes a problem too because then we're taking authority on ourselves to understand what it is that God is doing right what about scientific claims uh, about miracles about the parting of the Red Sea you know how does that affect scientific claims these historical claims from the Bible mm -hmm. certainly the Bible makes historical claims and they're important for us to, to recognize as that um, but when we're talking about the claims that's uh, uh, the claims, scientific claims mm -hmm. in the Bible. We're talking about, uh, does the Bible give us a way of uh, understanding how the world regularly works? Um, how the mechanics and operations of the world go? Is that what the Bible is doing? And I would say that no, it is not. Certainly some of the events like the parting of the Red Sea or the incarnation or the resurrection, uh, those are historical events that have scientific implications. But we don't try to explore those scientifically, at least it might not get us very far. But right. the Bible doesn't really intend to give us information about how the world works on a regular basis. Okay fascinating. But if the Bible is true, we believe the Bible is true, wouldn't it have real scientific knowledge hidden inside it? Even if the original audience wouldn't understand it, wouldn't God code in science for us to discover later on? Well, God can do anything that he wants, but the fact is, number one, what's his purpose? His purpose is revealing, not concealing. He's revealing himself. Now, it's true that there are some prophecies where the fulfillment is, is not known and, mm -hmm. and that's to unfold, uh, but that's a different matter altogether. Uh, God is in the process of revealing and we need to read the text in that light. Uh, secondly, it's the idea of how, how do we attach authority to things that we read into the text. If it's all, all our right. creative imagination that sees these things, uh, then how do we attach authority to that? We're interested in going to the Bible to find out what the authoritative message is. So when we find stuff in there that no one has ever known about before, we are making ourselves the authority. If it wasn't something that the author intended to give, that's exactly right. Uh, Which sometimes a little bit dangerous. It, it is.
I did my graduate work at Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati uh, in Old Testament and Ancient Near East. My wife was doing her work at the University of Cincinnati in biochemistry. Uh, we decided to wait to have kids until we were both done, and so uh, once I got my first job out of my degree, uh, we began our family. One of the things that we decided was that we wanted to spend a lot of time reading to the kids and to use those reading opportunities to have conversations. And so I spent loads of afternoons and evenings just sitting on the floor as we read book after book after book. And I really loved it. So we spent a lot of time reading. Uh, read to them after I got home from work, read to them after dinner, read to them before bed. And we just spent a lot of time reading and talking about the things that we read. And my wife and I decided early on that it was uh, not always very successful if you tried to prompt the kids to certain conversations. They seemed to feel like we were interrogating them. So we just decided that we would have conversations. And so we'd sit at the dinner table or in the kitchen as the dinner was being prepared. And my wife and I would just talk about things, things of interest to us. And sometimes, of course, that involved Bible and science because I was in Bible, she was in science. Our kids would listen, and before you know it, they would be chiming in and joining in the conversation. So all the years our kids were growing up, uh, we had conversations around the dinner table, not, not planned, just sort of the things we talked about. And those were, uh, those were important times, not just for raising my kids to be thinking people, uh, but also for me to be thinking through issues, for my wife and I to be talking about them together. Um, it wasn't just, I have this position and I'm, uh, I'm set and that's all there is to it. Uh, it was always uh, an open-ended open conversation. And I think that that was uh, an important uh, discipline uh, for myself, uh, just to be always thinking and interacting. And so the science and faith issue was, was big in our house. And uh, it's not like my wife and I were trying to persuade one another to different views. We didn't even necessarily talk about what our final conclusions were. We just talked about issues. My kids still very much enjoy a good conversation and uh, the deep thinking that goes into these topics and how we ought to be able to think about them. Archaeology helps us to learn a lot about the ancient world. And most importantly, it gives us texts from the ancient world. And in those texts, such as this one, we get information about how people thought, how they lived. And in that sense, these texts give us a window to the ancient world. That's important to us because the Israelites lived in that world. The Bible was written in that world. God communicated his truth in that world. And so as we discover more about the ancient world through the literature that has been preserved, we can understand more about how people in that time thought that may be very different from the way that we think. And in that way, we can avoid imposing our own ideas as foreign ideas onto the text. So we need to think the way they thought. We've now laid a foundation. We've talked about the authority of the text, and we've talked about how that authority is connected to the ways we think about God and science and the Bible. So we're now ready to go into the biblical text itself. As we go into it, we want to make sure that we try to work carefully at understanding what claims it is actually making, because it's in the claims of the text that we find the authority of the text. If the claims that we end up identifying are just a matter of our interpretation that have plausible alternatives, or if it's a matter of imposing culture one across the other, those would have no authority. And so we have to make sure that we're seeing clearly what the text has to offer. So we're engaged then in text analysis. Now, I want to start, instead of starting in verse 1 and 2, let's start with day 1, starting in verse 3. Actually, let's start with verse 5. There it says that God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Question, why didn't God call the light light? Isn't that unusual that he called the light day? Well, 
It's strange because, of course, light isn't day, and day certainly sometimes is light, it often is, but why, what's going on? Uh, in fact, of course, we can make the adjustment easily enough because we look at it and we say, oh, okay, what, what is day? Day is a period of light. Okay, so God called a period of light day and a period of darkness he called night. That makes sense the names that he gave. Okay, naming, by the way, is a creative act in the ancient world and to some extent in our world too. Naming is a creative act and so in that sense he's creating day and night. He's using the light as an instrument to do that or a period of light. If we back up to verse 4, God separated the light and the darkness. Again, if we were thinking of this text as a physics text, that wouldn't get us very far. You can't separate light and darkness. They're not together. One is the absence of the other, and so that doesn't work real well. Okay? The light of the sun gets to us in eight seconds. Um, how long does it take the darkness to get to us? Never mind. Okay, so the idea of, well, what's going on in, in verse 4? Well, of course, it works again. It's the period of light that's separated from a period of darkness. And the period of light is called day, period of darkness, night. Okay, fine. So in verse 5, it's a period of light. In verse 4, it's a period of light. Verse 3, let's be consistent, shall we? God said, let there be a period of light. Because after all, in verse 2, there was darkness. And what God is doing is calling a period of light into existence. And so a period of light okay, is entered in and distinguishing periods of light, periods of darkness, and the period of light he called day and the period of darkness he called night. What that means is, what is being created on day one? Besides day and night, it's the periods of light and darkness, periods of day and night, alternating, God created time. On day one, God created time. There is no material object here. Light was not an object to them. We even have trouble with that when we learn physics. Okay, and darkness certainly is not an object. There is no object being brought into being here. God is rather setting up a function, the function of time. Now, with that observation, we're ready to go back to verse 1. In the beginning, God created. That word for create is the Hebrew verb bara, and we need to understand it on its own terms. We can understand the text just on the basis of English. We have to understand it on the basis of Hebrew. So we take a look at this verb, bara. It turns out it's used about 50 times in the Old Testament. That's how we figure out what words mean by how they're used. That's always true in our own language as well. There are about 50 occurrences. God is the only subject of that verb, so it's a divine activity. But what's more interesting is that it takes a wide variety of direct objects. You can find out a lot about a verb if you find out what the object of it is. So, God created what? What are the kinds of things that God could create? It's an interesting list. We find out that God creates people groups. God creates Jerusalem. What kind of creation is creating Jerusalem? God creates phenomena like wind and fire and cloud and calamity and darkness. Those are not material objects. God creates abstractions like purity. Create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, O God. So God creates all sorts of objects that are not objects. They're not material. And we discover then that this verb bara is something different than a material manufacturing process. All of those things have to do with functions, with things working the way they ought to. And for God to get something working is a creative act. Now, bringing that information finally to verse 2, we find out that we're running right on the track with the author here. Again, remember, we're trying to figure out what story the author is telling. There are lots of different ways you could talk about origins. We've got one chapter here. What part of the origin story is God telling through this author to his audience? He's going to choose the part that, again, with his conventions, is most important for that context. We believe theologically that every aspect of origins was done by God. 
material, functional, operations, everything was done by God. But which part of the story is the text telling? Now, part of that we can determine by where it starts and where it ends. Okay, and in verse 2 we find out that it starts not with zero matter, but with zero function. The formless and empty of verse 2. The sea is there already. It's not talking about the material origins of every aspect of the cosmos. It starts, rather, by describing a non-productive, non-functional situation that already has material in it. And so in that sense, darkness and sea in verse 2 are part of a non-ordered scenario in the ancient world. And the verbs, I'm sorry, the nouns that are used there uh, talk about lacking worth or purpose, uh, places where nothing is done, nothing is accomplished. Uh, the Egyptians have a parallel. They talk about the non-existent. And the non-existent could be the desert, could be the cosmic sea. To them, that was non-existent because for them, existence had more to do with operations and order and function than it had to do with material properties. And so, for them to bring something into existence was a different sort of act than a manufacturing act that we tend to think about in our material ways of thinking. Now, my proposed thesis then is to say that in the Bible, the interest in origins is a functional interest. They want to focus on God setting up the world to work, to bring order to the world. There is starts with non-order. That's Genesis 1-2. God's not going to change non-order into order. He's going to bring order into the midst of it. And that ordering process is what creating is. Think about even the way we use the word create in English. We could talk about creating a committee, creating a curriculum, creating a masterpiece. Those are ordering behaviors, ordering activities. And so the same thing is going on here, even though we're dealing with, of course, Hebrew, not English. So in our functional focus, existence is defined by having a function, a role and a purpose in an ordered system. That's what defined existence in the ancient world. It wasn't related to having a material structure. When the text talks about something being good, that's a, that's a statement about the functioning process. That is, it's ready to roll, it's ready to work. Think about the uh, air, airline pilot in the cockpit before takeoff, going through the checklist, ready to go, ready to go, ready to go. It was good, it was good, it was good. Okay, and we know that the text is using good that way because of something that's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. That's not ethical, that's not moral, that's not a design flaw, it's just not not ready, qu quite ready to function yet. Genesis 1, then, I propose, contains an account of functional origins, the origins of the ordered cosmos, not an account of material origins. Genesis 1 is about God bringing order, functionality, into the midst of non-order. Now, it's then fruitless to ask, what things did God create on any given day, because the text is not concerned about the existence of matter. In this way of thinking, and it's, it's true throughout the ancient world, in this way of thinking, naming and separating are acts of creation, because you separate something out by giving it a distinct role and a distinct purpose. Here's a way that you can think about it. Um, we we live in a residence of some sort, and we could think about that residence in terms of it being a house. It's got certain framing, certain siding, certain kind of roof, electricity, plumbing, uh, certain kinds of floors. Uh, that's the house. Uh, we could also talk about the home. Which room is what? How's the furniture set up? How's the traffic pattern? 
How do we go about living here? How does this house function as our home? The house story and the home story are two different stories. And you could talk about how your residence began as a house, or you could talk about it how it began as your home. What I'm proposing is that in Genesis 1, we don't have the house story, we have the home story. And it's talking about how the house, which is the cosmos, became a home. And we'll talk about that a little more as we get further on in our discussions. When we think about the house story, which is what science explores, the house story, the house story of the cosmos, we find ourselves insignificant. That is, we are just one little bit in a large population. We're on a large planet where we're very small as an individual. The planet is a tiny speck in a solar system, which is a tiny speck in a galaxy, which is a tiny speck in an expanding universe. And with the house story, we are insignificant. When we think of the home story, we are honored guests in God's home. Now, the function of Genesis one, the first day, is time. The function of the second day is that God sets up weather to work. The function of the third day is God provides food. Again, in each of these situations, uh, for instance, the dry land emerges. Uh, he says, let the plants sprout. He's talking about functions, again, not material manufacture. And in those first three days, time, weather, and food become the basic elements that make our environment. This is where we live. Every conversation that we have eventually comes back to time, weather, or food. Think about the conversations you might have in the grocery store or at the bus stop. Not so often quarks and molecules. Think of Genesis 8.22. As long as the earth endures, this is right after the flood, as long as the earth endures, what's going to be sustained? Seed time and harvest, that's food. Cold, heat, summer, winter, that's weather. Day and night, that's time, will never cease. This is how people thought in the ancient world. In days one through three then, the text is talking about the three most basic functions and it's proclaiming those functions. The basis for time, the basis for weather, and the basis for food. In days four through six, it's installing the functionaries. Sun, moon, and stars inhabit the area of time, and the birds and the fish and people. And especially as we get to the role of people, we are in the image of God. That addresses our function and our identity. It also addresses who we are as people. That is, that we are here to represent God to be his stewards in his home. And so the image of God focuses on us not as a bunch of bones or a lot of atoms. It focuses on us as people who have a role in his place. And so that's the image of God that we need to understand from the text. That gives us an identity, and that's true of all of humanity. We all have an identity, and this describes that for us. And so as we think about Genesis 1, we have to think about it as the home story, not the house story, and try to understand it in that way. God is responsible as the builder of the house as well, but that's just not the story that it's telling, because that's not the one that's most important. So you're talking about bringing a functional focus to Genesis 1 and that account and not a material focus. A functional focus, does that help us answer questions like what was the source of light before day 4 when God created the sun? I think that it very much does. The, once, if we recognize that the text is dealing with the important functions first, days 1, 2, and 3, and then it goes on to talk about the functionaries, uh, then we realize that this is not a material sequence in which God brought things into being. And therefore, the text is not saying that there was light before the sun. 
Uh, it's rather focusing on time as an important function and right. the light's okay. involvement in that. If, and if that is the case, though, if, if we're focused on functions, which is really interesting, can we still talk about material origins? Can we, you know, isn't that in there too? Uh, certainly we can talk about material origins, uh, but we can't assume that the biblical author was interested. But doesn't in it sound origins. like, when you read Genesis 1, doesn't it sound a lot like God is making stuff? It may sound like that to us, but that's because we approach it with that idea in mind. Okay. In other words, we've already got that in our frame of reference. and Because right. so, it was in my children's Bible. Yeah, that's it right. was things, yeah. animals were popping up out of the ground. And of course, God did make all the material stuff. I'm just saying that's not what this part of the story is focusing on. What do you mean by functioning in the sense of, you know, the, the sun on day four? What was it there before day four? And if so, was it not functioning? Was it not a burning ball of gas? Was it not emitting light? What does it mean that now the sun is, is functioning? Well, was it not plugged in? Was it hooked up, but the switch was off? Well, remember when we talk about functioning in the way that I'm trying to describe in the biblical text, we're talking about functioning in an ordered system, having a role and a purpose in an ordered system, and that ordered system is focused on a place for people. If people aren't there, it's not functioning. So you're saying it's all about us. It's, it's all about us because that's how God made it to be all about us. But it's all about us in the important way that it's his place. And when, destined. how does the sun then gain that role on day four? What happens? Well, it's identified and proclaimed to be that. And that's... God speaks. Right. And the minute he identifies that role in this ordered system with people in it, then it exists in that way. That doesn't mean it didn't exist as a burning ball of gas for who knows how long before that, but okay. it wasn't functioning for people. And notice that's what the text says. It's for signs, seasons, days, and years. These are functions for people. Hmm. So it's not talking about scientific functions. It's talking about the functions that it has for us. Mm -hmm. One of the criticisms that has been leveled against you and mm -hmm. your book is that this is never what the church thought, okay? Throughout history, we never find a time where anyone taught this in the church. So are you saying that we've all been wrong up until now? now that's certainly not what I want to be heard saying. Um, before we get to the Enlightenment, uh, the, we find church fathers and Jewish authors uh, who talk about the functional aspect and recognize that. And so we, we do find that kind of discussion early on. They're not using the same kind of terminology that I'm using, but they're talking about creation in those terms. Uh, certainly by the time we pass the Enlightenment, uh, things have taken a radical turn in another direction, and materialism okay. and naturalism all become very important. So, so you're saying the material focus really was, was emphasized and became, came to the front in the Enlightenment. Right. It's not that it didn't exist before, but it came to the front there. Remember also that um, the earliest documents that we have discussing all of this um, mm -hmm. in relation to the church and our doctrine are already past the Hellenistic period. Uh, and that is, it's not the ancient world anymore. It's the Greco-Roman world. Right. And therefore, you know, the rabbis and the earliest church fathers, uh, even the intertestamental literature, are dealing with a Greco-Roman world, a Hellenistic world. And do we have information that they didn't have? Do we, we know things that they didn't know? That's what archaeology has provided. See, and that's how we can get back into that world in ways that, uh, you know, until the last hundred years or so, no one was able to do. Because now we have documents, literature from the ancient world, that give mm. us a window into that way of thinking. It's like a time machine. Uh, almost. We've now talked about the idea that to get to the authority of the text, to read the text as seriously as we can possibly read it, means that we've got to try to understand it against the claims that the author is making. What story is this text trying to tell? What part of the origin story? And I've suggested that it's telling the home story, not the house story. And that those 
would line up with the claims that the text is making. If we try to draw other claims from it, we have to be very careful because we may end up doing something interpretively or culturally that the text is not doing, and that will undermine its authority. Now, when we talk about this as a home story instead of a house story, whose home is it? What are we talking about? Anybody in the ancient world who would have read this text, an Assyrian, a Babylonian, an Egyptian, they would have read this and they would have gotten to day seven and they would have said, oh, this is a temple text. Now, I suspect that when you have read the text, you have never once made that observation. Where in the world would you see temple here? I mean, it doesn't mention anything about a temple. Well, this shows kind of how we are a low-context audience in a high-context text. The text talks about God resting. In the ancient world, gods rest in temples. Temples are built for gods to rest in. And therefore, any time you're talking about divine rest, you're bringing in temple imagery. And anyone in the ancient world would have caught that. So when we talk about the authority in the high context communication between the author and audience in Israel, we have to see that there is a temple imagery involved. Rest is the main goal of creation. Here we are on day seven. It's interesting that when you try to make this a house story, you don't know what to do with day seven. There's no material involved there. But as a home story, it becomes the focus of the whole passage. So people may be the climax of the six days, but the rest of God is the climax of the creation account. So in the ancient world, God's rest in temples and the temples are constructed for deity to rest in. Now what you need to understand in that context, that rest is not disengagement. That's what we think of when we think of rest. Leisure, relaxation, a nap, uh, that would be rest. But in this kind of context, rest is not disengagement, but it's engagement in, a ordered, in an ordered system. So, resting expresses having control, exercising control, over an ordered system. Okay, so when we think about, for instance, when we move into a new house to make it our home, we have to be engaged in the process of bringing order to that home. We've got non-order. All the boxes are still unpacked, sitting in piles. There's non-order. It's not functioning as a home. But there it is. It's a house. Then we have to unpack the boxes and get everything set up, arrange the furniture. That's an order-bringing process that makes it a home. When we're done that process, you may well feel like laying down and taking a nap, but the fact is that's not what you've done it for, so that you could take a nap, so that you can disengage. It's rather now so that you can operate in that home. The home is now ready to work, and you can live your life there and exercise control over that environment. And that is resting. Rest is engaging in the control of the environment that you've brought order to. When God talks about bringing rest to his people, in Deuteronomy, in Joshua, even in Hebrews 4, rest is the idea of being able to function in their ordered world. God gives them rest from their enemies. That doesn't mean he's offering them relaxation. It means that they won't have all the incursions and the chaos and the anarchy of invaders and they can live their lives. And that's the rest that God offers. And eventually there's an eternal rest, which isn't an eternal nap. It's an eternity of living in an ordered context. And so rest is the idea of expressing that control. The rest that God gives then is the opposite of unrest. Think of how we use that word in English, unrest. You know, everything's messed up and problematic. Rest is when all of that's resolved. So the order bringing process of creation leads to God's rest, his engagement in operating the world. Now we can see this in biblical text. We can see it all over the ancient Near East, but we can see it in biblical text too. We take a passage like Psalm 132. 
Um, there, uh, starting in verse 7 or so, uh, let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. You can see it's temple language here. Okay, arise, O Lord, come to your resting place. That's what the temple is, his resting place. You and the ark of your might. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. And he said, this is my resting place, the temple. Forever and ever, and here's the key, here I will sit enthroned. God's rest is his enthronement, not his leisure or relaxation. Now that means that in Genesis 1, we are talking in temple terms. That's what happens when God's resting. So if we ask the question, whose home is it? It's God's home. He has taken up his rest there. Now that means that what we have established is this period of ordering that takes place, after which God enters, as he would a temple, and rests, that is, exercises his control in that environment. He ceases the ordering work, and it's not like now he's kind of done and nothing's going on. It's rather now it's ready to rule. And when people say, what did God do the eighth day? What did God do the ninth day? He did exactly what he had set it up to do. He ruled over this ordered cosmos that he set up. Now, that actually gives us a way of thinking about the seven days of Genesis 1. In the ancient world, when they built a temple, they would spend a long period of time on the house part, the material phase of the building, constructing, all of that, the stone and the gold and the materials and the furniture all taking place. Then what would happen when that's all done? Is it a temple? Nope. It's just ready to be a temple. It's not a temple till God's in it. So what happens is, after all the material work is done, then there is a temple inauguration, which is going to launch it. It's like now moving into the home. It's ready to, to operate as a temple, as God's dwelling place. And they have an inauguration ceremony, and often in the Bible, often in the ancient Near East, that inauguration ceremony is seven days. And the idea then that in Genesis 1, as we tell the home story, the seven days, and I'm perfectly fine with it being a literal seven days, 24-hour days, but of course that would have nothing to do with the material cosmos. It has to do with the house becoming a home, God's home. The cosmos is sacred space. God is in it. And that's the whole point of it. This house that has been prepared, this cosmos, is now going to begin to function as God's home. And he has put people there to be his honored guests and his stewards and his vice regents to continue maintaining order in ways that they are designed to do. So the word yom, day, suggests a 24-hour period, but that would not be something that would help us talk about the age of the earth. That might be the case if it were a house story, but if it's a home story, that's not the case at all. If the seven days functions like a temple inauguration, then objects are not necessarily being made in those seven days. Again, the material phase has to all happen and be ready before the inauguration takes place, because otherwise it wouldn't be ready for it. If the days are concerned with bringing order rather than making things, the seven days has nothing to do with the age of the earth. Another way to say that, of course, is that the Bible is not making claims about the age of the earth through the use of this day structure. And therefore, there would be no entailments about whether the earth is old or young. Those would be things that we'd have to figure out using other information. 
because the Bible would not be making that sort of claim. Now, this leads us to sort of a grand conclusion about this analysis of chapter 1. The conclusion would be that the text asserts its claims, right? The text asserts that in the seven-day initial period, when Genesis 1 talks about the beginning, the beginning is the seven days. It's not something that happened before the seven days. That first verse is a literary introduction to the chapter, telling you what story it's going to tell you. So it says, in the beginning, God created, bara, gave functions, brought order to the cosmos. And here's how he did it. It started out non-productive. And God brought order through those six days, and then it began functioning as his house when he enters into it. So the text asserts then that in the seven-day initial period, God brought the cosmos into operation by assigning roles and functions. He made the house his home. And so that's the way that we should think about what the text is doing. Again, my, my claim would be that this is what the biblical author is communicating to his audience. We always want to think in terms of science. We want to think in terms of material. That's our way of thinking about origins. But we can't impose that. Remember, a literature has its conventions, and we have to observe those conventions. You talk about the difference between a home and a house. Uh, can you unpack that a little bit more? Sure. I like the word unpack. Uh, that has to do with moving into <laughs> we have a home. To unpack our house. Yeah. I mean, a, a house is, is built, the structure is built, and maybe it could lay empty for years, and the roof works, and the electricity works, mm -hmm. and the plumbing works. The pipes probably froze. Yes, but, but nobody's using it, and therefore it, it is capable of functioning but it's not functioning as a home. When people go house hunting, uh, they'll walk into the place and maybe uh, the father might look around and check it out as a house. He'll check mm -hmm, out the, the mm -hmm. roof and the plumbing and the electricity and all of those things that make it a house. Uh, maybe the mom goes looking around to say, you know, let's see how this is gonna work as our home. Where's the furniture going to go? How's the traffic pattern? Uh, uh, this is a dining room. Let's make it a study. Mm -hmm. uh, let's make this an extra bedroom. Okay, that's the home part. Mm -hmm. And the house has to accommodate that, but that's a different kind of discussion. Of course, the kids are running around saying, which room's mine? Right, mm -hmm. right. And so that relates to God's activity in taking the cosmos from a house to a home. Right. At some point, God built the house, mm -hmm. but that's not this story. This story is about how that house is made a home, a home for God mm -hmm. because it's sacred space and he's going to dwell in it, rest in it. Which room did he pick? You know, the, the best one, and he deserves it. <laughs> okay, but if the, if the cosmos is there, okay, before Genesis 1, the cosmos is there, you could touch it, um, but yet it, it doesn't exist yet. How can you say the cosmos doesn't exist mm -hmm. if it's there? Well, I would say that it doesn't exist if you think of existence in terms of a certain functional situation. Uh, let's use the example, since we're talking about temples, let's use the example of Solomon's temple. Okay. Uh, Solomon spent many years building the physical structure. The stone had to be quarried and shipped and shaped. The furniture had to be built. The, the cedars you know, from Lebanon. Yes, exactly. All of that work had to be done. That was the material aspect of it. When all of that was done, there, there was the temple. Does it exist? Yes. No. no. Okay. It's ready to exist as a temple, but the temple doesn't exist because a temple presumes God being in it Okay. and worship being performed. See, but I'm a modern Westerner, and, and if it, I can touch it, it exists. Does that make it hard for me to understand this stuff? It does. It's very hard to get our minds around, but if we ask the question, does the temple exist? 
we can understand that the structure exists. Yes. But does the temple exist? Which would relate to church. You know, it's a church building. Does the right. church exist? Exactly. And we have the, we wrestle with the same thing. Well, sure, there it is. It's white. Yeah. And then you have to correct yourself and say, no, that's not what it's the church is until correct. it's functioning and has a body of believers. It's not a church. Absolutely. Okay, I can get that. Um, another interesting point that, that really caught me by surprise. You say that God resting on the seventh day isn't about hitting the couch. It's, it's not about watching the game. It's not about doing nothing. It's not about disengaging. It's about engaging. Can you go into that a little more deeply? And, and what does it mean for me on the Sabbath? Yeah, the idea that God rested you know, I explained as having to do with engaging and ruling um, that rest is the opposite of unrest and that uh, therefore when everything's ordered, now it's ready to be controlled, to be ruled. Now, that poses us a problem when we think about, well, what does that mean for me? Right. I always thought that do I was... Can I sit on the couch on Sunday yeah. or do I have to start ruling something? Yes. Uh, is, is it about me ruling? Do I have to take over my neighbor's house? <laughs> You know, we've always thought about that our observance of the Sabbath was somehow us imitating God, that if he took a break, I take a break. Um, right. But if he's not taking a break, if it's right. ruling, then what are we doing? I'm confused. And I would say that what we are doing is acknowledging that he's in control. He is the source and center of order, not us. And okay, we so do we that, disengage to, to recognize that he is engaged? We disengage from our attempts to bring order to our own lives so that we can recognize that he is the one who has brought order and is the source of order. And so we are recognizing his role when we stop trying to do the order thing on our own for ourselves. Right. Wow, I'm even more motivated to disengage this Sunday. <laughs> So lots of times people ask me, how did you get to start believing the way you believe now about Genesis 1? As I've said, I was raised uh, with a young earth position and certainly went through an anti-evolutionary kind of position uh, because in the 70s, if you believed in evolution, you didn't believe in creation. And so I, I went through those phases and as I came into my teaching career, that was sort of still my default position. Uh, in my doctoral work, I'd specialized in Genesis, uh, as well as in the ancient Near East, and so I was becoming more and more acquainted with that ancient world. And that helped me gain some uh, perspectives on the book of Genesis, but it still wasn't really changing anything about the way that I believed. As I started my teaching career, uh, I often described myself to my classes as an uncomfortable young earth person. I was young earth because uh, as I read Genesis 1, uh, the word day, yom in Hebrew, uh, I didn't know any other way to treat that except as a 24-hour day. And so to that extent, I was very committed to a serious interpretation of the biblical text as I remain today. I was uncomfortable in it because I felt that to try to make the science work with that um, created some, just some complicated and difficult situations that I, I struggled with. But my commitment was to the biblical text, and so there I was, an uncomfortable young earth person. It was in the late 90s when um, a moment came, and suddenly things took a different direction. I was teaching a course, uh, an upper level course on Genesis, a Hebrew text, dealing with a, a small number of students. We were going through Genesis 1. And we were talking about day one, and I asked the question to the class, why didn't God call the light, light? And trying to work through that and thinking about, well, the, the light refers to a period of time, so he called it day. And if it refers to a period of time, then we have the alternating periods of day and night. And that means that on day one, God created time. And it was really the first time that I'd said it that way. But of course, it, it made very good sense with the text. And then the next line I said sort of changed everything. I said, so what we find on day one 
is that God's not creating an object. He was creating time, uh, a way that our world worked. And, and I just stopped in the middle of the line and thought, oh my, that's, that's the key. That's what I've been missing. He was creating order and function in this world. Uh, that's what, what makes this passage different from what we might have thought that it was. Well, we spent the last, rest of the class period just talking through all of that, talking about what its implications were. Um, and over the next uh, year or so, I continued my research and developing that position. In my mind, this was how we could go about taking the text seriously as an ancient document. I didn't come to that position because of what I found in ancient Near Eastern creation accounts, but once I hit on that, I saw that in the ancient Near East creation accounts, it was the same thing. It was a focus on order. And so that was really the beginning of thinking about Genesis 1 in a very different way. Uh, a way that suggests that it was not dealing with the material origins, but that it was dealing with the origins of order and function in the world. And that's been the path I've been following since then. We've talked about how people are being in God's image. That's really important for us to understand. You know, people are all kinds of different sorts. There's people doing all kinds of different things in life, working different jobs, living different lives. And when we think about that, we notice that despite how different people are, there's something the same about all of us, that we have something in common. And we can't help but think how we got here. How is it that there's such diversity, and yet we're all sort of the same? And so we want to understand more about human origins, how people came to be on this earth, who we are. And that's the important question of this segment. All the preparation we've been doing so far will now come in handy because we're now coming to the question of human origins which is the most controversial of all of the topics that we could discuss. Again, it's certainly not my intention to talk about science and the various scientific theories. I want to understand what it is that the biblical text claims, because that's how we're going to go about making our first uh, level of decisions. So we need to make sure that we understand the text clearly. We've talked about the concept that uh, the, uh, the, the first chapter of Genesis with the seven days is focused on a home story, that it's focused on functions rather than the material world as we know it. Does that carry over to chapter two and human origins? And if so, how? Those are some of the questions we want to address. Now to begin with, we have to talk about what is the relationship then between that first account, the seven days, and the second account with human origins. Is chapter two just a more, giving more detail about day six, that's often what we assume, but that's really not something that we can assume. We have to try to investigate and see what it's talking about. For that matter, we then have to understand how this segment of scripture is working literarily. How is it accomplishing its task? We have a new literary introduction that comes in chapter two, verse four, the second part of it. These are the accounts of the heavens and earth. That introduces a new segment. That's an introductory clause that occurs throughout Genesis to introduce new segments. That suggests at least the possibility to us that chapter two is a sequel rather than something that's synoptic. Now, synoptic might not be a word that you use very often. Uh, if we talk about a sequel, we might be talking about something like Luke and Acts. Whereas if we talk about a synoptic, we'd be talking about Matthew and Mark. Okay, so is chapter 2 just rehashing something that was covered in chapter 1? We can't necessarily assume that it is. Again, it could be, but it doesn't have to be. If chapter 2 is a sequel, rather than a fuller expression of day 6, that would mean that the people in chapter 1 are not necessarily Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve could come at a separate time uh, in a separate circumstance. Again, it doesn't mean they'd have to, but they could. 
We want to know what the biblical text has room to consider in terms of ideas. The cosmos as a sacred space, from chapter 1, functions on behalf of people. Even though it's God's home, he doesn't set it up to function for him. He sets it up to function for us. And that's all the functions that are talked about in chapter 1. But then in chapter 2, people are put in, put in sacred space, and sacred space is then supposed to function on their behalf. Not only that, people function on its behalf. That is, people function for sacred space. Sacred space serves them, chapter 1. They serve sacred space, chapter 2. As we talk then about what are the possible relationships between these two sections, we find out that both can be understood in functional rather than material terms. The first sets up the cosmos as sacred space to function on behalf of people. The second sets particular people, Adam and Eve as it turns out, in sacred space, the garden, to function on its behalf. So how is it that the text portrays Adam and Eve? We have to see what claims it's actually making. I'm going to suggest to you that in Genesis 2, everything that they say about human origins has to do with viewing them as archetypes. Now, when I say archetypes, I'm referring to the idea that they are representative of all human beings. Uh, just because someone is an archetype doesn't mean that, that they're not real, that they're not real people. Abraham's a, an archetype for all who believe, but we very much believe he was a real person. And I believe that Adam and Eve are real people in a real past. But the text is not so much interested in that, it's interested in them as archetypes. And we're going to see that in the kinds of information that the text presents. And of course, that will impact the claims that it's making. The making accounts, if we can call them that in chapter 2, are most relevant then to Adam and Eve as archetypes rather than as individuals. When we look at what the archetypal issues are, we can see that we have two basic uh, pieces of that uh, discussion. First of all, there's the question of dust, and secondly, the question of rib. Now, the idea of humans being made from dust is known very well from the ancient Near East. Uh, almost every account of human origins in the ancient Near East talks about materials. Sometimes it's clay, sometimes it's the blood of a deity, sometimes it's spit of the deity, all kinds of different things that are brought out, but all of them have to do with trying to convey the nature of the deity. There's a famous Egyptian relief which shows the god Khnum standing before a potter's wheel. Khnum is the, the creator god in this instance, and there's a human being on the potter wheel that's being formed by the god. What's interesting in this scene, the pharaoh is the one being formed, and it's not talking about his material origins, that is how he came into being materially. It's talking about him being formed for a role or a function, the role of being pharaoh. We find that when the Bible talks about this idea of forming Adam from the dust, we also have a statement being made uh, that's archetypal, that talks about the nature of all humanity. Because after all, we don't look at dust as the chemical composition here. We understand that dust has a different role to play in this story. The illusion being made is picked up in the next chapter when it talks to us about the idea that we are all dust, made from dust, and to dust we shall return. What's the archetypal aspect? Mortality. Now, what we find out then is, um, is it just Adam made from dust? No, because of course we're all mortal. This is something that's true of all of us. Adam is an archetype. We see this clearly when we get to Psalm 103. In Psalm 103.14, it says, For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are but dust. Same terminology as Genesis 2. Yet the psalmist uses we. We are all made from dust. We are all formed from the dust of the earth. But that is not a statement about your material origins. 
It's a statement about God's role in making each and every one of us for the roles that we play. And therefore, Psalm 103 does not make a statement about material origins. It talks about what we all are. And it doesn't preclude us being born from woman. If we carry that back to Genesis 2, this statement about Adam being formed from dust talks about his nature and is not making a statement about whether he was born from woman or not. That being the case, we could say the Bible is not making a claim about Adam's material origins. It's making a claim about his archetypal nature. Every human being is formed from dust, and Adam is the archetype of that. So, when we think about Genesis 2, already we're thinking in functional terms, not material terms. It's not a story about the material origins of Adam, rather his functional terms. Now, what, what is the function that it's talking about? What is Adam formed to do? We know he's made from dust, so he's mortal. But what's the, what's the function that's involved? I would like to suggest that it's a priestly function, and we'll return to that point in a moment. We first have to talk about rib. The word in the biblical text does not refer anywhere else to a piece of anatomy. So we're kind of stuck with this passage. Other times when it's used, it refers to something architectural. And it's usually talking about a side, like if there are two doors, there's one side and the other side. It talks about sides that come in pairs. Okay, so the, the balanced wings of a building, each one is a side. When God takes one of Adam's sides, he's taking one of something that Adam only has two of. That's fairly radical. We're talking about him taking half of Adam. Think about a side of beef. That might help you. Um, also, notice that he's not talking about just a rib, meaning a bone. Adam himself says, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. There's more going on here than the removal of a bone to build a woman. Now, the Israelites, of course, don't think in terms of anesthetics. They don't think in terms of surgery. They're not thinking in those terms, although the text does say that God closed up the flesh. Is this a surgical procedure or what's going on? We get a lot of help from the fact that the text talks about Adam being put into a deep sleep. When we see that motif in other places in the Bible, we find that often, for instance, Genesis 15 with Abraham and his vision, being put into a deep sleep is so that God can show him something important in a vision. Not that he's going to show him something in the outside world. Remember with Abraham, Abraham saw a vision of God passing through the pieces to ratify the covenant, something extremely theologically important to understand the nature of the covenant. Here, Adam is put into a deep sleep. One interpretation certainly would be that he's being put into a deep sleep to be shown something in a vision, to see himself cut in half and a woman being built of the other half. And when he wakes up, he knows exactly what he's looking at. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And notice that the biblical text tells us the archetypal element here. For this cause, a man will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. That's true of all mankind and all womankind, that that's the nature of the relationship. It's saying something archetypal. This is not the material origins of a woman. This is the nature of womankind in relationship to mankind being shown in a vision where his half is taken. Now, the woman is going to serve a particular role right alongside of the man. That's why... This is being shown to Adam. What is this role? Does the text help us understand it? Yes, it does. In Genesis 2.15, it talks about the fact that they're in sacred space to serve and to keep. Now, in the, uh, in the books of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, those are priestly terms and priestly roles. And, of course, priests are the ones who operate in sacred space, who maintain sacred space, who keep order in sacred space, who indeed keep it sacred. And the role that Adam and Eve are given 
is to maintain sacred space. Remember that we started the whole account with non-order. Now we have brought order into this cosmos. God is the center and source of order. That's his role as creator. And his presence in sacred space, the Garden of Eden, the terrestrial sacred space for the cosmos that is sacred space, is now his home. God's presence there means that it has become sacred space. And Adam and Eve are given a role to continue maintaining that order and even growing that order. Now, of course, what unfortunately happens is that they allow disorder to come into it when they try to make themselves the center and source of sacred space by taking wisdom to themselves. Remember the serpent says, you will be like God's center and source of order. And so they try to bring order for themselves. Now, if this is the archetypal nature of the account in Genesis 2, the account is not making claims about material human origins. If it's an archetypal focus, then that's the authority that's being laid out in that biblical text. And if this is not an account of human material origins, we have no biblical account of human material origins. Remember, we have to be careful about what claims we say that the Bible is making. Now, that doesn't mean that, okay, well, I guess common descent and evolution are true. No, that, that wouldn't be our conclusion. Our conclusion would say, if the Bible doesn't tell us, we have to look other places to figure out what we think. And you still always have to analyze the science to see if it makes some sense. In this view, there's still some special direct work of God, minimally in endowing people with the image of God. The image of God certainly is not something that I believe could evolve. This is a role, a function that's given to people by God. Okay? The creation of a spiritual being. We believe as Christians that we are not just a, a material machine. We have a spiritual nature, and that's not something that could evolve. Whatever else could evolve, that's not something that could evolve. The designating as priests, these are all creative acts. God is giving a role. God is giving a place. God is putting us in this ordered world with something to do. And he's giving us a nature that is something that he has designated. But you notice all of those things are not part of the material picture we have to try to ask legitimate questions about what the text is claiming. God says that it was good. We talked about that already. It was not good for man to be alone because man could not carry out this function in sacred space that way. And so we have the creation of human beings. The account is an archetype account, not a material origins account. And that helps us to understand who we are as people. It also tells us what claims the Bible is or is not making. So we can look around at what science offers to find out whether it offers something helpful and persuasive or not. You say that Adam and Eve are archetypes. Uh, just for those of us that aren't as learned, remind us what is an archetype again and how does that affect what we would learn from Genesis? Mm -hmm. An archetype is basically one that represents a group, uh, represents the whole. Um, so for instance, we talk about Abraham as the, the, uh, the archetype of faith. Uh, he's, he, we're all in Abraham and, and because we share his faith. Uh, when Paul talks about um, Adam, and talks about Christ. The, the whole use of first Adam and second Adam is archetypal. They're representative of the group. And so that's what an archetype is. So how does that affect Genesis 1 and 2? Well, I think it's important because when we try to understand what is it that the text is trying to present as it presents Adam and Eve, uh, we ask that question in Genesis 1, what story is the text telling? Uh, and I'm asking that same question in chapter 2. What part of the story is the text telling? Is it telling the individual material story or is it telling the archetypal representative story? 
And yeah. as, as I've uh, developed in the material, I think that uh, they're telling the archetypal uh, materials. Once again, my, my modern rational self doesn't like that answer. I want it to be, you know, science. I want it to be explanations of concrete things and individuals. Mm -hmm. And it just seems that the ancient world wasn't looking for those Exactly. Answers. And that gets us to the very important issue that we've been talking about over and over again. We have to take the Bible on its own terms. We have to make every attempt to read it seriously, a close reading, mm -hmm. to find out what it is doing, rather than trying to extract from it mm -hmm. um, the answers, the kinds of answers that we want. So is it possible, um, if Adam and Eve were, were archetypes, were representatives, if Eve wasn't actually the mother of all living things, which is what Adam referred to her as. Mm -hmm. How could she not be the mother of all the ancestor of all humanity if Adam said, you're the mother of all living? Well, of course she might be, but she wouldn't have to be. Uh, a couple chapters later in chapter four, some of Cain's uh, descendants are the father of all those who live in tents and the father of those who play musical instruments. And there we see a term like father used. Are you saying used, they weren't? Not biologically. You, if I live in a tent today, d can I trace my lineage back to that child of Cain? Only archetypally, not biologically. And so in that sense, those, even those terms father and mother have archetypal use to them. Wow. So anywhere in the Bible does it suggest that Adam and Eve weren't the first people. Uh, it wouldn't come right out and say that, but certainly there are indications in the text uh, that that may not be the case. And these are things that we've always considered problems. Where does Cain get his wife? Um, when she God... Was, she was a mail order bride. <laughs> apparently. Um, when God drives Cain away from him, Cain says, oh, now anybody who finds me will kill me. Who are these anybodies that he's talking about? And then before you know it, he's building a city. And right. who's were, he building a city for? They were highly productive. So in that sense, um, the text doesn't indicate clearly or explicitly that there were such other people, but there are hints there, and that would be one way to answer those questions. Wow. The things we're talking about are not just academic subjects. They're important for the church. This church is maybe 50, 60 years old, beautiful church, but we are the church and we're over 2,000 years old. And we need to be concerned about our health as the church. And we have a mission that's been given to us by Christ. And we take it seriously, but we don't always execute the way that we should. One area that I think of is that we're not serving well those among us who are scientists. Scientists often feel marginalized in their workplace because they're people of faith. And then they come to church and they feel marginalized here because they've accepted certain scientific conclusions that maybe aren't very popular inside these walls. You know, Jesus had a way of reaching out to those who are marginalized. Even the shepherds, they were approached by the angels, and those who were marginalized were brought in at that first announcement. We need to begin seeing that we need to welcome them and help them to learn how to put their worlds together, their world of science and their world of faith. A second area that I think of is the area of evangelism. Uh, too often in our world, we may encounter people who might be very open to the gospel, but they've come to think, whether we've given them an idea or they've gotten it somewhere else, they've come to think that if they are going to become Christians, that they have to totally revise the science which they firmly believe. And so, the scientific conclusions become a hurdle to the gospel. And I'm worried that we have encumbered the gospel with obstacles that don't belong there. We need to begin doing evangelism in ways that will not create a hindrance in Bible and science.
for some of those folks to consider the claims of Christ. A third area that comes to mind involves our own young people who grow up in the church. And sometimes we convey to them somehow that if they accept certain scientific conclusions, that they have therefore rejected their faith, rejected the Bible, rejected Christ, and they've believed us. And when they go off to university and hear the claims of science and are persuaded by them, they think they've got a big decision to make, to either accept science or to reject it in order to hold on to their faith. With the things we've talked about today, I think we can give them a different message. And that message is that even if they accept those scientific claims, they can still hold firm to the Bible and to sound theology. They can still be part of the faith. And I'm hoping that we can stop the attrition, the hemorrhaging, some would say, of young people away from the church by giving them alternatives for reading scripture soundly, seriously. In the end, I think that we have to begin focusing on values that we need to recognize so that we can proceed as the church. Those values are represented in some of the affirmations that we make and some of the commitments that we have. Our affirmations are ones like we affirm that God created everything that exists. However we define creation, God has done it. God is able to create either instantaneously or through long processes that could be traced through materialistic explanations. God is able to do it any way he chooses. Thirdly, that human beings are unique creations of God and therefore they have a unique dignity and worth. A fourth affirmation, the acceptance of evolutionary explanations is not inherently godless, though some make it out to be that. And the last affirmation, that the wonder of the universe testifies to the glory of God, the Creator, regardless of the means or the mechanisms that He used to bring it into existence. These will lead us to three basic commitments. First of all, we are committed to taking the Bible seriously. By seeking more informed models for understanding the Bible in more nuanced ways of interpreting it. We're committed to taking science seriously. Scientific inquiry is important and we want to seek more informed models and more sophisticated ways for understanding the universe and the world around us. And finally, and maybe the most important, we must be committed to interacting with each other with grace and peace, and to seek reducing the barriers that could lead to understanding one another better. We need to be God's people at the church. I hope that what we've talked about today can take us a few further steps along that path. God helping us. Thanks for listening.